Hey, welcome to The Real Tea with T3, and we're going to be spilling and serving about real estate and so much more. Um, so to get, get things started today, I'm Tija Harris, the team leader of Texas Trio Team, and I've got my teammate and team member over here. Hi, I'm Kendra Genches, and I'm ready to get going today. Absolutely. And we're so excited about today's guest. And so we've got Doug Gibson here. So Doug, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what keeps you busy these days? Well, what keeps me busy and what I do are, these days are probably two different answers because it's summer, so the kids aren't in school. So that's the busy part. But what I do for a living is uh, I'm the vice president of sales for a financial advisor, uh, financial services firm, Exponent Advisors and Smart Group Houston. Um, it, it, it does have two different names. We were talking about that before. Uh, we offer a multiple a range of services for business owners and professionals. And then we also serve the needs of individuals. And so for our business owner services, we brand those under Exponent Advisors. And then the individual services, we brand under Smart Group Houston. So we kind of have two umbrellas depending on who we're working with and what mm -hmm. services we offer. So how did you get into it's the, the financial aspect of things? Like what was the early start for you? Yeah, so that's a great story and, and how we became connected in real estate because, uh, you know, when, when the market kind of crashed in, in 2007, 2008, and 2009, uh, I, I was just kind of, you know, coming out of, of college and, and really starting to uh, get into the fields. And I kind of determined I was going to go into real estate and financial services and see which one I liked. And I ended up going into financial services, but there was something always inside me that really had a passion for real estate. I, I just couldn't couldn't get away from it no matter how hard I tried and in the different directions that I wanted to go so eventually what I had done is kind of incorporated real estate services and my passion for real estate into my services as a financial advisor so you know in today's market and in most clients the real estate holdings are the largest transactions that they have in their life and so there's a lot of strategies and a lot of things that they can do to help mitigate uh, the various taxation that they're going to come in to uh, you know come into play with those transactions and then there's also a number of strategies and things that they can do from a structuring standpoint to help them be properly protected depending on their you know their whether their rentals or, or, or a vacation property or, or their primary care or primary home so you know I, I really started to incorporate those strategies and look for every opportunity that I could to put real estate into what I was doing as a financial advisor in my daily operations yeah, so you said that you had a lot of real estate. Was that something from your background or just it was just kind of a, a, a yearning that you had by, by just every avenue that you came across? I think it was just playing Monopoly as a kid. It just, you know, <laughs> you like uh, money. It, yeah, no, fell in love with it. Just, you know, real estate development and property and, and, and owning things and, and then selling it and, and moving up and buying another one. And, you know, all of that was just so attractive. And of course, yes, the money. I, 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 no, never any way to get around that part that's always the driving force uh, as much good as we want to do in these things obviously we want to make a living at it. right mm -hmm. so when you went to college was that something that you were um, invested into uh, getting you, a knowledge about or you bet yep uh, I, I have a degree in in management and, and business administration with a minor in marketing so it was always a big part of what I did yeah so now you started your own business and you know you went through the education you had the drive for it but did you notice anything as a new not now that you're new but when you first started as a new entrepreneur that was a challenge that you were like if, if i could look five ten twenty years back that i would tell myself to do differently uh, oh yeah absolutely uh you know what it, the funny thing is you you kind of learn from the mistakes more than you learn from the successes and looking back i remember uh you know there's been a number of successes and and you know those those are great but i've always had uh, you know the the memory of the failures that has kind of caused me to pivot and, and change and to do some different things um, so, you know, in, in reality, I wish I kind of would have started incorporating real estate and some more complex strategies into what I was doing earlier, uh, you know, and, and kind of, you know, really deviated from the, the traditional path of, of being a financial advisor. Because I think, you know, I usually tell people that's the most challenging question that there is that you ask me that I have to answer is what do I do? Because what most people think of when I say the term financial advisor is very different than the conversations that you and I have had mm -hmm. and the conversations that I have with my clients. So, you know, because of those scope of services and the things that we do, incorporating things like
like, you know, 1031s and opportunity zones and real estate and taxation and entity structure for, you know, real estate transactions. That's all very different than the common conversations most people will have when they talk to a quote unquote financial advisor. Yeah. So, Doug, a lot of my investor clients, you know, just starting out, they don't know if they should get an LLC or how they should proceed. Do you deal with that a lot? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's a very important aspect, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, the, the conversation typically goes like this when I talk to clients. They say, well, you know, how are you structured? And they say, well, if they do know, right, to your mm -hmm. point, they say, well, I'm in an LLC. And I say, well, why? And they say, well, come my CPA told me to, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. always the answer. Mm -hmm. And and so there's there's a lot of trust with the, the relationship to CPA, and there's some good CPAs. But you also want to make sure that the business and the way you're structured today is effective for where you're going, not for necessarily what it looks like in this picture in time. Mm -hmm. So we always look at all of the comprehensive aspects of the client in terms of what they are doing. But what the CPA doesn't have the ability to do is look at that into the future. Their job is 12 months in the rearview mirror. That's the whole, you know, mm -hmm. that's their job, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we're looking into the future. How many rent properties are you going to own? How are you structured today? What do you need to be structured as you grow based on what growth rates you're projecting into the future and what you really want to do and what you want to accomplish? Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with you're dealing with individuals that have probably have, you know, equity in their property and they might want longevity for their family, but you're also building business portfolios for people. So just on a time frame of working with individual customers in your experience, how much time do you need from the initial conversation through the, their plans do you yeah, need? That's a great question. And, and it really is a nuanced answer because it depends on what they're trying to do and, and what the strategy is going to be for entry and exit for them based on what they're ultimately trying to accomplish. It, it, you know, it, the much as, as much lead time as you can get me is, is the best, right? Because that's ultimately going to give me the opportunity to make sure all of the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. With conversations like 1031s and, and Opportunity Zones and 721s, there are time restrictions in each of those strategies. And when we start incorporating things that are, you know, complex in terms of the LLCs and the structuring, it's very important to make sure that those rules are followed because if you do one thing incorrectly and you take one wrong step and you don't file the way you need to file or document the way you need to document the entire strategy is null and void and so you're ultimately going to have a higher tax bill than what you potentially could have so we like to get you know six months is probably the minimum i would say you know in terms of a, a hard date but again as much lead time as you can get me is going to be the the most advantageous really uh, aspect so like Kendra was saying like you have people we have, we have clients that are investors <clears throat> that are maybe just starting out and mm -hmm. so you know it's a hot market right now inventory is low and so when you're looking at properties you know they want to pull the trigger like immediately on something and they may not have the time to wait six months to start buying properties and building their equity and net worth and all of that so is there solutions for that if they started buying properties now or the, to go back in arrear with you or it's like no we should probably halt on everything you wanted to do get ducks in a row so no i mean there are things that you can do right depending on how you structure it there are different deadlines for you know llcs than there are for people that purchase as an inv individual uh, so there are different time frames for different aspects and different people depending on how they do it. So, I, you know, I would never say, especially to real estate ladies, that, uh, you know, if a client finds the deal that they're going to lose, don't not take advantage of that deal because it's going to impact certain things that you could potentially, you know, could impact you on the back end. A, a lot of this is, hey, you know, kind of let let us figure it out right bring me bring me your situation because that's really kind of the, the what i get from a lot of my referrals is hey i've got a client that's getting ready to close next week and you know they're they're going to have a lot of gains coming from another property but then they're going to do another one in three months or they're going to you know, do some construction and flip it, you know, it, it, that's really the situation that I love. That's the phone call that I really, really enjoy because then we can go to work as a team, not only myself, but the people that I've got behind me with my firm and really create a, a detailed structured plan for those guys that are going to give them the ability to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. And we can move fast. Obviously the most, you know, it, it's, it's easier for me and it's a little more advantageous if we have some lead time, because again, there are some complexities to the 
these things. And I don't want to throw a lot of these things that are new concepts to people the first time. There's, it, it really takes them time to really be comfortable with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in any environment, there's ways that we can get extremely creative and make sure that the client could take advantage of those deals immediately and still do all of the things that they want from a benefit perspective and a tax perspective down the road. So absolutely. Yeah. And so when, while we're sitting here, you're throwing out a lot of vocabulary that we work in every single day, but just for the average person that's watching Opportunity Zones, 1031s, mm -hmm. you know, even capital gains, like those are things that we get asked about a lot. And what's your insight and your input on realtors talking about those things with people? I think the, the question I might kick back to you is how do you answer that question, right? I mean, you know, from, from I my I know experience, someone at the smart group that can help you. <laughs> I, I, that's the perfect answer. <laughs> my goodness, I love it. Uh, it. You know, but that's that's really where, you know, I it, it kind of molded my passion for real estate to, you know, my current role as a financial advisor because that's that allows me to offer those things to those clients that have those questions and really get them comfortable with what we're doing to, to marry the world of real estate uh, and, and kind of financial services because they, they do go hand in hand in a lot of different aspects. And a lot of these strategies, you know, from a real estate agent's perspective, you guys, at the end of the day, you want to help and you want to be a, provide a service to your client. And because you care, you want to give them the information to help them understand what's going to impact them from a tax perspective. But you're also somewhat restricted under what you're allowed to talk about. And so that's really where I'm able to come in and say, hey, I can help you facilitate this conversation with your client as my job and really kind of be a bridge to getting your client the answers that they need to make informed decisions to get your deals closed faster so that you can execute the transaction that you're trying to execute the buyer the sell with the client and so that's that's the beauty of, of kind of this uh, symbiotic relationship of these mm -hmm. two things because it works really well together to help give your client the information and I love that answer because that's exactly what I hope to accomplish by being able to do this because again you guys want to help and you want to get them the answers and so having them give the ability to agents to connect with someone like me to help get your client those answers to allow them to take advantage of the deals that you're bringing to them I think is a great relationship absolutely so you had said earlier that you have a team like when it's crunch time you guys all get together mm -hmm. so can you tell us a little bit about your team like what all that encompass yeah you got it uh, and this is one of the areas that i think really sets us apart from other advisors uh, and again this goes back to the challenge of answering the questions about you know financial advisor and, and trying to separate what you think of in your head to what i actually do uh, we have two cpas that currently work on staff at our firm I'm not a CPA, but since we're talking about taxes and real estate and strategy, that is a major, major aspect of everything that the client's doing. And in, in, in my presentations and seminars that I do, it, it really is unique in terms of the number one answer of a concern that a client has across every demographic in every state, in every circumstance, number one is always taxes. And so that's a major, major aspect of the things that I do for, for a living behind the scenes to help a client understand taxes understand their options and help to implement strategies to mitigate them so as a firm we have a tremendous amount of resource and dedication to taxation and to building and understanding strategies behind the scenes uh, i have a, a an advanced planning team that does nothing but complex financial plans that allow me to be out visiting with you because they're behind the scenes building these strategies testing them to understand do they work are they going to make sense in this particular situation? And putting it into a format where we can sit with a client and show them this is what it looks like if you do what you were doing today. This is what it looks like if we apply some of these concepts and strategies. And then it's very easy for them to understand them and see does it impact their bottom line. If we present something and it doesn't do what we want it to do in terms of tax saving, it doesn't help them make more money and earn more, uh, you know, kind of grow net worth, mm -hmm. they're not going to 
do it, right? Mm -hmm. But how do they know that information if we don't put it into a format where they can very easily see it and understand it to be able to make the informed decision? Mm -hmm. So I have a tremendous team behind me that's doing those things. We've got CPAs that are involved in reviewing and understanding and making sure all of the rules that need to be followed and those boxes that need to be checked are taken care of. And then I'm able to go sit in front of the client and connect with them and really present all of these Mm -hmm. things and spend as much time as it takes to get them where they need to be because of all of the work behind the scenes that's been done for my team right and so when you were building your team like i'm sure when you got into it you know there wasn't a team and so did it take a long time to figure out these are the things that these are the individuals that i need and you know how did you become such a solid team leader or a business owner where you were like i can trust it and we are flowing naturally now it, it, it does take work, uh, and, it, and it has something that's developed over time because, you know, you're, you kind of start as an advisor with a lot of autonomy. You can be your own silo if you want to. Uh, and so it's, it's really something that ramps up as we grow and as we move into new things and new strategies, we understand, hey, I need somebody to be able to do this. And so we bring on another team member to be able to do those things. As taxes started to become a more significant component of, of all of our planning, we started to bring in the resources to be able to review tax returns, to understand the complexities, make recommendations. So it kind of happens organically, just like any other business. You know, as you become larger, you start to service more clients, you start to generate additional income and revenue, you add other product lines, you start to build that team and really bring the people in behind you to be able to support that, but then also to take you into directions that you want to go in terms of new services based on interest. The entire components that we're talking about from a real estate perspective, that's relatively new in in terms of my firm and really in the industry. There's not a lot of people that have the real estate perspective. And that was really something that was brought on because of the need and the identification of saying, hey, we service business owners and real estate is a significant component of those business owners. We need to offer services targeted to those areas. And so that's kind of what we've done to really build that avenue and that aspect to be able to help clients with those larger transactions like real estate. Yeah, so you've got everything and you kind of develop your niche of like talking to real estate agents because you know they're working with the people that you you need to be working with on a regular basis. Yeah, and, and again, it goes back to the, the, you know, from our perspective, the two largest transactions that clients will typically have is their business and their real estate, right? And since our core was already in, in really working with business owners, you know, why not bring in a leverage the second biggest transaction that a lot of these business owners are going to make? And then as you work with those two, there's a lot of, you know, sort of overlap, right? Because most business owners, they own property, they have resources, they own warehouses, they own office buildings, they own the the things that are needed for them to operate the business. They operate the trucks that are needed to service their various industries. And so a lot of those strategies, the same strategies that we're able to apply to real estate in this context, that we're talking about for for homeowners we can take the same strategies and apply them to the business owners it's just a slightly different application and structuring it differently yeah so we have clients all over texas is it something that you can work with clients remotely do they have to be in office or what does that look like so this is a, a great question again because you know 2020 it, covid kind mm-hmm. of changed the business operations for everybody mm-hmm. we have the licenses and the capability and we have had for you know as long as i've been in business the ability to service clients all over the united states but really before that we were in a you know face to face sort of a handshake environment mm-hmm. But then, you know, COVID came and and everything became, you know, very differentiated for a period of of time there where you were forced to operate Mm -hmm. on a remote basis. Mm -hmm. And so that that was a blessing and a curse at the time. It was, you know, obviously a curse because what was going on in the economy and the environment. But it became a blessing because it kind of forced us to change really and, and bring in the capabilities to meet with clients virtually all over the United States. So now it's really an option. And so we have clients in, in, in almost every state. 
uh, and we do have the ability to meet with clients. I travel all over the United States, I, you know, travel out to LA several times a year, uh, New York, Florida, to meet with clients and, and visit with people in, in certain markets and certain aspects. So, you know, the rules change a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of every state having a little bit of a different tweak, twist to terms of how we do things and, and how things are, are done. But that leverages back to the team and the people that are behind us and having the resources to be able to give information and all of those different aspects and, and make sure that the clients are able to be serviced. So the answer to the question is, yeah, we can absolutely work with clients remotely. Uh, some clients prefer it and some clients, you know, when we can, we still want to do the face to face. And so I'm able to do that and, 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 and service the client based on what their preferential model is. That's awesome. And, you know, that's another reason we actually wanted to start this podcast and have this conversation is yes we're selling real estate all day long but at the same time like there was a divisiveness for so many years and you you and many other business owners learned to pivot and to still operationalize everything that you're doing um but now it's time to bring the conversation back you know bringing people back together and learning from one another you know different trades and fields and so on and so forth so we're excited that you made the pivot and you didn't shut down and you just kept going you know like other high performers no and and i love that and i appreciate that because i'm excited as well uh you know podcasting has really really taken off uh i've i've looked at some of the uh you know the the mediums that people are consuming these days and you know obviously there's more based on all of the technology and all of the things that people are doing but podcasting is 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 i, I think in the last study that i read the number one medium now of, of people consuming and seeking out information and to be able to have people like you that are incredibly distinguished very knowledgeable professionals in real estate and in your markets to be able to bring that knowledge and reach your clients at their convenience whenever they want to listen right is fantastic because you know you can't pick up a, a, the phone and, and call a real estate agent in the middle of the night with a question about a property or something like that but if you can access the information from home on a podcast especially from people as qualified as you are it, it, it's really really terrific and so it's resonated and that's why the industry as a whole has taken off mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely and um, whenever you are working on things as far as like projections for yourself like are you doing annual reviews or are you looking back on a quarterly basis with your team just like because you've obviously made adjustments through the years and you're growing mm -hmm. and expanding where do you see yourself in the next five years so, I mean, we're in the process of uh, relocating to a new office. We're, we're going from, you know, a, a moderate space to a, a, a very, very nice building here in Houston. We're almost tripling the amount of space that we have just because of the growth that we've had in the past, but also with the growth that we project in the future. So we're constantly bringing on new qualified people. In our market with the clients that we serve, you know, we, we really are at a place where we can be selective with talent that we bring on. And so we really, it, we're always quote unquote hiring, but we're looking for people that are distinguished, that have, uh, you know, the, the, the knowledge and the skill sets to fill some of the gaps in the areas that we want to move into, to continue to service our clients uh, at, at an extremely high level and offer creative solutions. And so, you know, this is all part of the growth trajectory, right? Uh, you know, I, I, when I when I first joined Exponent Smart Group three years ago, uh, and where we are today, and where we're going to be in six months, is it's just been tremendous. So I mean, the firm has has had significant growth, and it's because of great relationships working with people like you and our clients. But also the strategies that that we offer our clients are very different, and it's resonated. And the biggest challenge that we typically have is getting this message about the things that we're able to do differently out to people, because you know they once we can, we have clients for life. I mean, we have clients that are third generation clients. You know, they they started the business seventy years ago, they sold it to their kids, the grandkids are now run. So I mean, those are clients that we've had for you know a very very long time and and it, with the ability to be able to do that and continue to service that is is really a testament to the strategies that we offer the knowledge and the skills of the firm 
uh, you know, for a lot of other advisors, they it's it's a performance and a fee based question. You know, I, I never lose a client because of fees and, and performance, even though I'm not the cheapest guy on the street, because the value that we bring in other areas, you know, it's it, it's not about, hey, this, it, you know, this advisor's given me 10 basis points less you know, on their management to their account and they've outperformed by one percent over the past three years. I don't have that conversation because I'm saving the client 10 to 15 percent a year on their tax bill so they really don't care you know mm -hmm. what the what the fees are to a certain extent and i say that facetiously because we are we are competitive but we're not always the cheapest solution but we bring a tremendous amount of value on the back end for everything that they're doing and so we don't have the typical conversations that a lot of other mm -hmm. guys were have trying to undercut price and price and price until you know you ultimately what you're going to end up with is a is an advisor who's not servicing you because they're not being rewarded from a compensation standpoint so mm -hmm. we don't even have those conversations because of the the relationships that mm -hmm. we have what is the greatest success story i'm sure there's a lot over the years but what has been like some just a memorable story with a client they were like okay this kept me in the business or this is why i love it I think it's actually one that I'm working on right now. I mean, you know, in a lot of these things, due to the complexities, um, you know, it's it's. I, we talked earlier about the conversations that that clients have, and they call me with problems, and they say, "Hey, this is what's going on. I've got a big problem. Help me fix it." And so this client is is tremendously successful, uh, but like most business owners, they spend 99% of their time in their business. So the operations in terms of, you know, a lot of these other things that go unnoticed, they pay their taxes, you know, they do what they're supposed to do. And unless they're being creative, you know, they're not really taking advantage of all of the opportunities they have because they're so focused on their business, right? Their business is their baby and that's where all of their attention goes. So we came into this client and they were just, you know, a basic S corporation structured, you know, uh, profits flowed to the, to the owners. You know, we have taken that simple aspect. We have created, I think, six or seven different companies out of this one basic operations of a roofing company. And we have structured them to effectively protect them on a legal aspect, but also on a tax aspect. We've saved them, uh, you know, a lot. I, I, I won't put uh, percentages or numbers on it, but we save them a tremendous amount of money every single year on into the future and put them into a, a, a really to be comfortable knowing that they're protected from a legal aspect. If someone falls off the roof or from a lawsuit, they can't, you know, kind of connect to the, 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 the other businesses. So we've shielded those from, from liability. We've saved them a tremendous amount. We've structured the, the company, the owners to be able to protect if one of them passes away in terms of a buy sell arrangement that also gives them access to have capital to grow their business so it's you know there's a lot that goes on into these things which is why our sales cycle is typically long but once we do these things when you look back and you say okay look this is what we started and this is where we are today I mean it, it, it's unbelievable I mean it really really is phenomenal and that's one of those instances where I say yeah, this is great. I mean, this this is why I get up every day to do things like this. Yeah, and it was so funny. Just recently, Kendra and I were looking at a picture from a year ago. It was like, what was that timestamp or something? You sent me something, and it was fascinating to look at like a year ago what we were doing and what was where we were at and <laughs> where we are today. It's like sometimes it feels like slow as molasses, but then you look back and it was like just a year ago, and things were so different and the growth that you learned in such a such a short amount of time. I, I mean, it's remarkable. I mean, look, a year ago you didn't have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and now you guys are reaching people all over the state of Texas and you're building your own brand and you're recognizing it's phenomenal. I mean, so, I mean, that's a tremendous point, right? It's uh, it, it, things happen, you know, what feels like very slow, but looking back, you're like, wow, OK, yeah, you, know, mm -hmm. you can really see the impact and the difference that you've made. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's very rewarding. And I'm sure you feel the same way that I do when you look back on those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going back to that story that you were just telling about the roofing company, like I was getting excited as you were saying, like I did this, I did this. Like, can I have part ownership of <laughs> the right? roofing company? <laughs> hey, I got to get mine first. I mean, <laughs> can I sneak a little bit in there for me too? Yeah. Like that's just so awesome. That has to make you feel so good. Like just doing so good for your clients because I know, like when we have a successful deal, like we party inside. Like it's so awesome. 
and, and you have the perspective, you know, to know what it's taken because clients don't see a lot of the stuff that mm -hmm. you do, right? So mm -hmm. when you get to see kind of the start to finish, you have the perspective of knowing everything that went into it behind the scenes. The client just saw a, a property mm -hmm. bought, a property sold, a property sold, a pro you know, the, they see the, the bottom line where you see everything that it took to get that to where it needed to be, to get that deal across the finish line. Yeah. And it, it's, it's so good. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is the best feeling in the world and, and that's you know kind of goes back to the point to you you want to help people i mean mm -hmm. you started to, to do what you do you liked real estate but you really wanted to help people in that particular industry and and the same feeling that i have because it it, it does take a tremendous amount i mean if i if if you were able to actually see all of the things behind the scenes that it took to get that client from start to finish to where it needed to be i mean it is incredibly remarkable but that's the same thing that we do you know really every day just maybe on a different scale for different clients mm -hmm. but it's all important right so you know we we don't uh, the the higher net worth clients and and the the lower net worth clients if that's a thing you know we treat them all the same and mm -hmm. and the satisfaction that i get from helping that client achieve their goal is no different than the satisfaction that i get from you know my number one clients or number mm -hmm. two clients or whatever the case may be because it's all about what it does for them and the impact that it has on their life and the success that it's able to help them achieve that's really where it becomes rewarding absolutely so you have a background in creating a profile for someone and like you said there's so much that goes into ebbing and flowing and creating that tapestry for a client that you know ends up being beautiful and um when you have a hard time like what is it that you do to get out of a rut or to have a breakthrough that you maybe have learned over time like you have to do this to get back on track I mean, in, in these type of things with the complexities that we just talked about, you know, they are slow. And, you know, with business owners and, and people that are successful, they're extremely busy. So time is, is really their most valuable commodity. And so, you know, the challenges that we always have is getting what we need to be able to deliver in a timely fashion and effective. And so sometimes those process takes you know, years to be able to do. I mean, those are always the, the, the most challenging ones just because there's a lot of different things that need to happen from a, a legal and a tax and, a, you know, a financial standpoint, in addition to be able to, to, to achieve the things that we need to achieve. In terms of probably what I do, you know, to try and stay focused, I mean, I, I wish I could say, look, I never get down and, and I never have bad moments or bad days or bad weeks, I think. Uh, you know, my wife could probably tell you that. <laughs> uh, it, it really is to just... Uh, understand that that's the way it happens and to try and stay positive and to try and stay focused and reflect on the successes and just keep working I mean just keep get up every day and keep working hard keep doing it if you believe in what you're doing and you believe that you, you know you're you're doing the right thing for the right client and you're trying to help people at the end of the day that persistence is going to pay off you know I mean, it's the old saying that if you help enough people get what they want eventually you'll get what you want right, right. so you know that's that's kind of the way that i operate and, and i would be lying if i told you i never had any bad days or bad times or deals fall through or things that i thought were phenomenal that did deliver value that the client just said no nah, it's not the right time or whatever the case may be whatever the circumstance was and that's tough right i mean that that really does things to you mentally when you put all of those things that we talked about into the back end the blood sweat and tears into the preparation and the time doing those things that you weren't with your family and missing birthday parties and traveling because you know you had to go see that client and get some face time so you know when things don't work out the way that they're supposed to do those do impact but you know I mean I, I, I just work hard at the end of the day I mean that's really all my my secret of any success that I've been able to have is is working hard I'm one of the first people at the office and I'm typically the last person to leave and that's that's a sacrifice that I make to to my family and to my kids and uh, but I I believe in it and it's important and so eventually one day i hope to be able to make up that time and be mm -hmm. you know sitting on a, a a beach somewhere with my family and uh then i can enjoy the things that i've done and all the sacrifices that i made in the past yeah mm -hmm. do you have a way of like work-life balance or is that just work 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 until the job's done and then go focus so this is a, a fun, you know, kind of a personal thing for me, but I, you know, my, my second job ever, I started working at, at really 
almost 15. And I've been working full time ever since. I worked 45 hours a week while I went to college full time. So, I mean, I was doing 18 hours of school and I was working 50 hours a week uh, in a furniture store. And so because I was in sales, it kind of the old thing that I just mentioned about working hard, I, I learned early about this whole, you know, kind of commission sales thing. The harder you work, the more money you make and the better you are and the more successful you are, the more money you make. So, okay, so uh, I, I, I can do this. So I, I sought out jobs that were, um, you know, kind of commission based and, and really in sales from my second job at 15 years old. And fortunately, I was I was always very good at it. But early on, you know, you, you don't have any skills or qualifications. And I'm not where I was today. So you work in retail, right? And so I worked at a furniture store. And, you know, it was it was incredibly demanding because you work Saturday and Sunday. So I was going to school Monday, Wednesday, Friday, working Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, every, you know, so it was a full week. And it, because it was Saturday and Sunday, I had no work-life balance. I didn't have any, you know. And, and when you're on commission, even when you take a weekend off to go coach your kid's, you know, t-ball game or whatever the case may be, you're, you're always worried in the back of your mind. It's like, oh, am I missing, you know, all the money and sales and customers that I'm missing and answering phone calls? And, you know, that was hard. And so what I've trained myself to do is when I'm not working, I work as hard as I can for as many hours as I can. When I'm not working, I just put the phone down and I, I unplug and I really try and be present with my family. And that was something I was terrible at, but I really had to focus on it. And I really had to dedicate time and energy into actually doing that when I was at home and trying to unplug. And my wife always gives me a hard time. She says, well, you can work from home, right? Everything's remote. And because I worked so hard to unplug from work when I'm at home, I'm the worst work from home guy there is <laughs> because my brain has now caught on to when you're at home, you're not supposed to be working. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was a challenge for 2020. Fortunately, we were, you know, in financial services. So we got, you know, whatever that exemption was, I was able to continue to work in the office and put in full, you know, my full work week and service my clients. But I don't work from home very well. So how I do it is really a trained process over the last 15 to 20 years to really unplug when I'm at home. And that's that's how I'm able to keep Sandy. Now, this doesn't work for everybody, so everybody's different, but that's the way I've been able to do it. So, you know, when I work, I work really hard and I work really dedicated. And when I'm at home, I try and be at home. Yeah, I mean, I remember my first year in real estate that I had a goal of the units that I wanted to sell. And, you know, I surpassed it of selling. I wanted 34, I sold 36. And so, but then I looked back and my kids, like I could tell that, I mean, they were little. So, I mean, like the, not resentment because they were so small, but it was just like, I realized that I had take that, taken that away. So I respect what you're saying and, you know, empathize with it as well. It's like, you have to come up with, these are the hours that I'm on and these are the hours that I'm on as a parent or I'm on as a spouse or whatever that looks yeah. like um, and toggle that on and toggle it off as needed. Yeah, and it's different for everybody, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not saying I would never tell anybody to take what I just said and apply it to them. Right. Um, you know, you really have to, you know, you know, I guess it all goes back to the conversation that we had in the beginning was, you know, successes and failures. You know, this is something I learned by failing at not being present when I was at home and not being able to unplug from my work when I might have been missing out on sales or things or opportunities. So, it, you know, now I just accept it. And, you know, I just learned to, to be at home when I'm at home. And that's something that everybody is going to have to kind of figure out for themselves. Sales, right you know for you, you 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 sold two extra houses but was the cost you know of, of doing that and the time away from your kids worth it to you and I could never answer that question for right. you you're the right. one that has to decide that just no right. different than anybody that's listening is able to answer that for them the only thing that I would say is is the only way that you're ever going to know is to try different things mm -hmm. and to change your routine and see if you know because I'm the biggest routine driven guy Me in the too. world yeah. and, and and changing my routine routine is hard. I mean, there are little things that I just can't change because that's the way I've been doing it for so long. But there are times when I find out I'm forced to change from my routine. I actually go, 
oh, you know what? That's actually better. I wish I would have stumbled onto that a long time ago. And the only way that you would ever know that is to try new things. Mm -hmm. And so figure out what works and what doesn't work for you. Force yourself to do different things. Something as dumb as take a different way to work. You know, we all drive the same way to work. And this is one mm -hmm. of those things where I learned it was an accident and I was forced to drive a different way to work. And I went, wow, you know what? This is a little better actually. So, you know, little things like that. If you don't try new things and, and you don't try to adapt and, and, and break your routine intentionally every now and again, you're, you may never know that there's something tremendous out there that, uh, that you could stumble upon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. So I want to dive back into the, the, uh, ins and outs of what you're doing every day for your clients. And so, um, to the three things that I kind of threw out earlier, one thing that we get that we know about and we mention it to a client and then we have to kind of shut it off is a 1031 exchange. Can you mm -hmm. give like just a little bit of insight into what that looks like and benefits you've seen from that? You bet. Yeah. 1031 exchange is a way for a client to reinvest basically any capital gains or proceeds or profits they're going to have that would cause them to have to pay taxes or capital gains taxes into another property. And, you know, the government has basically said, hey, we want to continue to encourage you to buy property and to continue to reinvest in the community in specific areas. So a 1031 is a way for a client to take the proceeds that is above any exclusions or basis and reinvest it into another property. And you can continue to defer your capital gains taxes. Now, this is a fantastic thing because who doesn't like to save taxes? But you also, again, have those rules. You have to identify a replacement property property within 45 days and you have to close on that property within 180 days. So you do have to make sure that you have some things in place to be able to cross those T's and dot those I's and that's where we have what's called a qualified intermediary that helps facilitate that. They're basically the rule keeper for these type of transactions. And so a 1031 is a great strategy for people that enjoy and like real estate because it allows you to continue to invest in more properties and defer any taxation that you would have on that property on the sale of the initial property. A, a couple of things that you always want to be cognizant of though is if that train ever ends, you do pay all of the capital gains taxes on the sale of the final property in addition to all of the deferred capital gains taxes from the original sale. So, you know, we will like to recommend clients, you know, really continue to do this until it's the quote unquote end of plan. Uh, and eventually your beneficiaries would get a step up in basis on the property and you would have never paid capital gains taxes. So there are a number of applications where this strategy makes a tremendous amount of sense. And so that's one of the things that we always look at uh, for the potential opportunities for clients for tax savings. What about opportunity zones? Yeah, opportunity zones, I can't speak enough about opportunity zones and the tremendous advantage uh, that they offer. These are, you know, 1031s have been around for a long, long time. Opportunity zones have been around since 2017. So they're relatively new. And because they're new, a lot of people are not familiar with the strategy and how much of a tremendous benefit it has. For, for those who are not familiar, an opportunity zone is a, a an area that the city has designated and the counties have designated and the states have designated that are targeted for investment. And so the government liked 1031s and said, hey, we want to encourage people to open up businesses and buy properties in these specific areas. And in order to do that, we're going to give you the ability to save the capital gains taxes and avoid taxation by investing in these specific areas. And so it's a tremendous advantage in this particular aspect because this is not only a real estate uh, aspect. You can do businesses inside of these, these opportunity zones. You can also bring capital gains in from any other area like cryptocurrencies. That's a big one with the success of cryptocurrencies and art and collectibles. Any capital gains are eligible for investment in opportunity zones. So it does not have to be just real estate like it does for 1031s and 721s. So it, it, you're, it gives you a lot bigger opportunity to defer taxes on different strategies. We see a lot of clients who have, you know, options. They've been with Exxon Mobil for 30 years and they've got Exxon stock that has a tremendous amount of taxes in, inherent in it if they sell it. 
And so what this will do from a planning perspective, we see a lot of concentration. We say, hey, if something happens to Exxon, your personal wealth is at a tremendous amount of risk. But the challenge is if they sell it, it's going to generate a lot of taxes because of all of the capital gains and the growth in the stock. So we can apply an opportunity zone investment or strategy for that client to help them reduce some of the concentration exposure in some of their Exxon Mobil. And I'm just using that as an example uh, because that's one area that we see with a lot of people that have these highly appreciated stock options. So being able to take those, those taxes to liquidate those holdings and take that and invest it into an opportunity zone or to start a business that's in one of these opportunity zone areas, this gives them the ability to invest in another asset that they can grow. And as long as they hold it for a period of 10 years, any appreciation is completely tax free. So if you start a business in an opportunity zone and it grows over the next 10 years, five times your initial investment, if you sell that business, you will pay zero capital gains taxes on the sale of that business or the, the, the acquisition of the property. So if you buy a property in opportunity zone, you hold it for 10 years and you sell it, you will pay not one penny of taxes on the sale of that property. So I'm a huge fan of opportunity zones. It's still very unknown for a lot of people. Uh, and the people that do know it a lot of times have some misconceptions about the potential quality of areas. Uh, you know, there's 8,700 opportunity zones. There's some, you know, in, in, in very appealing parts of Houston, uh, you know, or, or where we're, you know, a clo couple close to here. So there, there's a tremendous opportunity to be able to grow and build wealth inside of, of opportunity zones. And it's just another, you know, sort of club in our bag that we can help a client uh, implement in the right circumstance. And we help them structure appropriately to take advantage of all those things if the situation warrants it, based on what their goals are to be able to do those things. Where do you, you mentioned crypt, cryptocurrency. What do you see that as far as a player and fa, as far as real estate and what you do? I, What's your feedback on it? Yeah, I mean, you know, from a cryptocurrency perspective, uh, I, I don't think there's anyone that wouldn't say it's the wave of the future in some capacity. Uh, now, I don't know whether that's going to be, you know, a different currency that the, the government's going to create and back, you know, by the Fed. Uh, that's probably the direction that will go. But there will always be some, some you know, other cryptocurrencies out there that, that have utility like Ethereum and Bitcoin. Uh, you know, those are probably the two biggest and, and, and the two most prominent these days. Uh, and there are people with, with you know, quite a bit of, you know, that were early adopters in, in Bitcoin eight, ten years ago that have millions of dollars of gain and profit. Uh, you know, for, so that's where it would overlap for me from an investment aspect. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're in risk management and mitigation when it comes to investments. So I've got clients that have all of their net worth in, in, in cryptocurrencies that I cringe at because, you know, again, they're overly concentrated in areas that are probably too risky, but they believe in it. And ultimately it's, it's up to them. Right. Uh, and then there are, you know, clients who aren't quite there yet that, uh, don't understand it. And, you know, that's, uh, that's the other end of the spectrum. So at the end of the day, we we want to help the client help them achieve the goals that they have that are personal to them and literally everyone is different just like a fingerprint or you know uh, anything like that the circumstances are always personal and unique to them so you know we we're going to help them build a strategy and execute those goals whether they tell me it's entirely in cryptocurrency or it's all in you know rental properties for real estate uh, the strategies, they're going to apply, you know, across the board in a lot of different aspects. So we're going to make sure that uh, whatever strategy is that they kind of say we need to go in this direction, we're going to make sure that they're capitalizing and paying the lowest taxes every step of the way, and they're protected in, the, in, in as much capacity as I can protect them to be able to achieve their goals. Moral of the story, have Doug Gibson on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. So yes, yeah, absolutely. And if you need my number, uh, these these two ladies can definitely give it to you. But I, I love it. I'll put that on the back of my we'll business cards. We'll put it on cards. like definitely yeah. description of mm -hmm. like what's your website, but we'll put it on the description or like a best. What's the best social handle for people to find you? So I'm pretty easy to find on social media. Uh, you know, I I, I have uh, LinkedIn and and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Facebook, all of them these days. It's uh, you know my my handle is at Doug Talks Money. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, pretty comprehensive because anything financial and, and, and anything, you know, investment related, uh, I, I have the ability to, uh, to help with, um, 
And uh, my website is doug-gibson.com, so you can find a lot of information about me. You can also see a lot of our real estate projects through a link on my website. So for those who are in real estate, we've got a, a link to all of uh, some great real estate projects all over the United States. Uh, and then, you know, of course, definitely pick up the phone, right? When you have these problems, or even if you just want to, you know, get a second opinion on something or, or run through a strategy or something your CPA said, or my other financial advisor said, you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you at the end of the day, if I think I can help, I'll tell you, if I think they've nailed it and you know, you've got a great recipe, there's nothing else I can do. I'm going to tell you that too. Uh, so, you know, I, I again, want to help as many people accomplish what they want to accomplish. If they're doing everything that they can do, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you and give you that information. Do you have anything else that you would like? One last uh, token of advice or anything that you'd like to share before? My goodness, I feel like we've covered so much. <laughs> well, um, and one thing I wanted to ask you, too, um, is you mentioned public speaking and traveling, traveling all over. Do you have any public speaking events or anything that you have planned or? What does that look like for you? Uh, I've, I've got a couple of next month. Uh, I, I really work a lot with real estate agents uh, because of, you know, your the challenge that you have in talking to clients about taxes. So a lot of these speaking engagements are with real estate and brokerage offices all over uh, all over the United States. Because, again, I think this is a, a natural way for us to to partner. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can help the client answer those tax questions. And, I, you know, when I started doing this uh, about a year ago is when I started doing the program for real estate agents. One of the one of the biggest questions that I got that I thought was very interesting was like, well, I don't want to have my client talk to you because you're going to talk them out of, of buying this property or selling this property because you're going to tell them how much taxes they're going to pay. And I was like, well, you know what? That's a good point. So let's let's figure out if that's really the case. And so what I actually found, though, was when I started talking to clients and, and really being cognizant of that potential situation because I didn't want that to happen, right? I want you guys to close more business. And in the end of the day, my whole program for real estate agents is to help you guys close deals faster and, and more, uh, you know, more repeatable. And so what I essentially found was in the process of, of being aware of that potential situation is obviously, yeah, we're going to talk to the client about taxes because we're going to be honest with them. We're going to tell them what their, what their taxes are. But what we found was instead of that being an impediment, I would be able to say, look, this is going to be your tax bill, but you can do this, 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 and this, and your tax bill that you thought was going to be X is now going to be zero because we can apply some strategy to it. And clients, what I actually found, again, when I started being cognizant of the question and the objection that I got from, from real estate agents was clients that <laughs> would not want to sell because they thought their taxes were going to be too big, those clients now said, okay, let's sell, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, let's go ahead and, and move the property because, you know, I thought I was going to have to pay a lot of taxes before, but now if I can get rid of all of them, I'm out, right? I'm going to be able to move on to the next property. And I'm sure you guys are seeing that with rates today. There's a lot of clients that are in houses that they would probably like to get out of, but they're stuck because of, you know, what the rate is on the property that they have now versus what it is if they did relocate. That same thing is, is you know, for clients that have been in properties a long time, they're concerned with this tax bill you know they they don't want to sell because then they're going to owe you know half a million a million two million whatever the case may be in in property taxes and if we can say you know yes you're correct that is the number but did you know you can get rid of all of it that's a much easier conversation and right. so if we can have that conversation with your client you're going to get the phone call back from that client saying okay let's go i'm ready to sell so what ended up you know initially being a potential objection from real estate agents kind of came in you know and eventually became a, a major selling point because it helped me achieve my goal of getting you guys more business and being able to move more properties in a quick and efficient fashion absolutely do you have any more questions my friend I think you covered it. Yeah, I think you did. Well, we want to thank you for, we value your time and sitting with us and giving so much knowledge. So this is a token from Texas Trio team over to you. <laughs> Take home thank over you to your office. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you guys. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and if anybody's looking at uh, buying real estate, I can't recommend uh, uh, Tija and Kendra enough. These guys are fantastic. So thank you. You're thank in great you. hands. All right. So as we close that out, you know, you can follow us at uh, texastriotteam.com and we're on all social channels as well. So go out and have a great day and make it your best.
Bye.